All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Camille Wimbish. I'm with the Ohio Fair Courts Alliance, and I'm so pleased to be with you to talk about our Blueprint for Democracy series. Tonight, we'll be discussing the intersection between race, law, and democracy. I've got a few helpers behind the scenes helping to make sure everything goes smoothly. Jessica, did you want to say a, a word or two? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica. I'm the Outreach Manager for the Ohio Fair Courts Alliance. And I wanted to let you know that PowerPoint slides and the recording will be made available to you after the forum. Um, in addition, we'll be putting links in the chat as we go along. Those will also be made available for you. And also, we would love for you all to be very active participants. So if you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the chat box, and we will get to them during the discussion portion of our presentation. Thank you. All right, well, let's get rolling to the next slide. Okay, well, thank you so much to all of our co-sponsors tonight. We're so pleased to have so many wonderful partners to help promote this event. Next slide. And um, tonight, this is a, a webinar series uh, that we are concluding tonight. Um, this is the third of the series focused on courts and democracy. And the goal has really been to educate Ohioans about some of the challenges and opportunities around our courts and to begin, you know, developing a fair courts agenda that addresses money and judicial races, ethical standards, and tonight we'll be digging into structural racism. And um, this is sort of a preview of things to come for 2022. Next slide. So here we are tonight um, talking about racism and the intersection between law and democracy. Um, I think all of this, all of us have been weighing, you know, what is the impact of uh, systemic racism, particularly in light of the up racial us uprisings from last year. You know, lots of folks have been um, more attuned to this issue, uh, particularly white folks who are sort of opening their eyes to some of the deep uh, injustices that have actually have been taking place for since the, the founding of this country. And so, um, you know, this, this picture is actually of the Ohio Supreme Court and um, some folks who wanted to really bring to light the fact that there are grave injustices that are occurring, not just, um, you know, with the police, um, but also through the court system. And at the same time, we're really sort of at this really critical um, tension point because as many of us on this call are really trying to grapple with systemic racism, there's also this like counterforce of you know, white supremacy who's really pushing back against the even idea of us to having these types of discussions and the, the way that we even educate our children about the history of this country. But for us here among friends, you know, we're here to talk about in order for our democracy to work, we really have to be looking at the systemic racial inequities in our laws and address them through our courts. Um, without doing so, we're basically having um, public confidence super low and um, the legitimacy of our courts and of our very democracy is really in question. So that's what we're gonna be doing tonight is sort of starting to unearth some of these uh, critical issues, begin some conversations and um, you know, figure out where we go from here. Next slide. So first up, I thought I, we would queue up what some of our um, vision for fair courts would be. And I thought no one could be better at doing that with, with than our friend, um, Tom Roberts, who is the state conference president of the Ohio uh, NAACP conference. Well, thank you, Camille. Our vision for the courts is a diverse bench of knowledgeable, knowledgeable judges represented and are accountable to the communities they serve. Courts treat all people with dignity, respect, and fairness. And we know this because courts have transparent data practices. Third, judges decide cases based on their merits, based on the law and fact, and free from corrupting influence of money, politics, and bias. And finally, Courts are agents of repairing harms and bringing about healing for individuals and communities rather than compounding punishment and oppression. 
This is the vision statement of this group. At this time, at this time, I will introduce the panel members, beginning with Judge Ron Adrian. Judge Adrian served on the Cleveland Municipal Court for 36 years and chaired the Ohio Commission on Race Fairness in 1994. His peers chose him to serve as administrative presiding judge of his court from 2009 until his retirement in 2018. He now serves as the first judge in residence of Cleveland State University, Marshall College of Law. He also serves as the commissioner chair for the Ohio Black Judges Association, which strives to bring greater awareness to the need for greater diversity among Ohio's judiciary. Our second panel member is Kyle Strickland. Kyle is a deputy director of race and democracy at the Roosevelt Institute and the senior legal analyst at the Kerwin Institute for the study of race and ethnicity at the Ohio State University. Kyle's work focuses on the latest policy ideas on race, the economy, democracy, as well as on civil rights issues of criminal justice reform, fair housing, policy, and equitable access to education. In addition, Kyle leads the coordination of My Brothers Keepers Ohio, a statewide network that helps provide educational and community opportunities for boys and young men of color. The next panel member is Ray, Reverend Raymond Green. Reverend Green is executive director of Block. His prior experience includes the organizing collaborative and Black Fork strategic in many different positions. These services and leadership roles were instrumental in training grounds, which cultivated Green Savvy as a strategic thinker and leader for Block. He used his skill set to build the largest voter registration team in the country. Green's collective efforts resulted in registering over 3,000 Black people to vote from 2012 to 2018. And our final panel member is Marie Bruno. Marie Bruno joined Equality Ohio in August of 2021 as the Public Policy Director. Marie has spent her career working to protect the basic and civil rights of underserved Ohioans. She is passionate about her protecting the rights and livelihood of every Ohioan within the LBTQ community. Maria has fought for justice within our legal system from various angles over the many years, including the Franklin County Public Defender and the ACLU of Ohio. She has most recently served as a civil, civic engagement coordinator and policy analyst for the Coalition on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio. With that, I welcome our first panel members, Judge Ronald Adrian. Judge, welcome to the program. It's good seeing you this evening. Judge Adrian, are you ready? Feel free to take yourself off mute if you haven't already. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Tom, it's really good to see you always. And thank you for the introduction. And to all of the members of the uh, panel, I I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say uh, about this issue. Uh, and I hope that what I have to say will be instructive. So we're talking about how judges can use their position to make systemic racism uh, or systemic change to reduce racism uh, as a systemic in our courts. Next slide. So some people get it twisted. You know, systemic racism and implicit bias, they want to conflate those two and make them into the same thing, but they are not. Systemic bias or systemic racism uh, is structural in its nature. And it's prejudice or bigotry or unfairness that's imposed by a dominant community, by its institutions upon uh, those communities that don't have as much power 
and it's implemented through their policy decisions and practices. When we're talking about structural or systemic racism, we're talking about rules and other things that have been put in place, regulations that make it difficult for people who are not part of the, the, uh, of the dominant group to thrive. Next slide, please. So these policies may appear neutral on their face, but when you dig down into them, that neutrality is just a myth. They're actually intended to favor the prerogatives of the dominant community and to advantage it over others. And as a result, there are disparate and negative impacts for those who don't belong to the dominant group. Again, these are intentional, conscious choices meant to advantage one group over another. Next slide, please. So implicit bias to the contrary is a lens through which each individual views the world. And we each have implicit biases. Nobody escapes from them. They're a function of who you are, how you were raised, uh, what you've experienced, and all of those things color how you see the world. It's a lens which we automatically employ. It's a set of shortcuts and heretics. Its purpose is to try to help us quickly come to decisions about things when we have so much information to process. And it's a lens that is always present for each and every human being. So there's anybody who says that they don't have any biases uh, doesn't know what they're talking about. Next slide, please. So implicit biases are not necessarily bad. They don't necessarily lead to uh, explicitly biased decisions or behavior, but they can uh, presage uh, you know, some of those bad and discriminatory uh, things, and they may sh uh, show themselves in nonverbal and subtle behaviors that other people pick up on. So just like schema, that is the way that we view the world, implicit biases are not inherently right or wrong. They're just there. Next slide, please. So you should note that institutions that make these policies that we're talking about are made up of individuals. And so as such, we have to figure out ways to ensure that the individuals who formulate these policies um, are required to surface their own personal biases so that they can have them up front when those policy decisions are made. And hopefully so that we can see those biases as those policies are made. Institutions have to come up with ways to do that and to enact organizational and personal accountability for the people who are making those policies that are, allow us to address uh, the unconscious biases that people have both before and after those, bi those biases make their appearance. So the bottom line is that even though you have unconscious biases, if you are aware of the fact that you have those biases, then you can take that into account as you are making your decisions. Next slide, please. So the, this slide outlines some of the systemic things that have happened over time that constitute uh, the type of policy decisions that have been made that have disparately impacted different groups that are not part of the majority. Next slide, please. So some implicit bias uh, examples are a distaste that somebody might have for uh, another person who has too much body hair or disgust that some people might have for folks who were overweight or the animus that individuals whose uh, ancestry is not Western European uh, may have. Next slide, please. So some specific examples of places where we might see systemic bias actually make its uh, appearance known are in juvenile bind over proceedings, where if you look at the way these are handled, way too many people of color end up getting bound over to adult courts, as opposed to uh, people who are part of the majority who are retained in juvenile court, where the penalties are a lot less uh, harsh. The crack versus powder uh, rules that were put together back in the 80s, allegedly based upon the fact that crack was such a much more potent uh, drug than powder cocaine, 
when the science came in, it turned out that that was not true. Crack cocaine, however, was used in uh, minority communities because it was cheaper than in white communities, which favored powder cocaine and, and therefore was not as pleased as well. Uh, the use of uh, pretrial detention algorithms has surfaced as a problem recently. And some of these algorithms are really good, you know, in uh, helping people get out of jail who otherwise would have been retained. But we have to keep an eye on them because some of the things that are used in order to put these algorithms together also tend to disadvantage people of color. So for instance, since uh, communities of color have a tendency to be much more uh, policed than white communities, uh, the fact that people have more arrests on their record and that is part of an algorithm as to whether that they should be released pre-trial is really uh, discriminatory. Uh, something like a purported race neutral approach in civil cases, for instance, where uh, civil support requirements uh, assume that whites and minorities have the same employment opportunities when in reality, anybody who's paying any attention knows that that's not true. And therefore, again, that policy decision disadvantages people of color. Next slide, please. So let's look at how, some ways that judges can actually do something with this. First of all, if they're aware of the fact that, that these kinds of uh, policy uh, initiatives are out there, then they can take that into consideration when they're trying to make the decisions that they're gonna make as it relates to individuals. And when they are really trying to work for systemic change, they should be looking at uh, how they can do that by changing the system, not by trying to focus on individuals. Getting individuals to change the way they think is always a difficult process. But judges, because of the fact that they're at the top of the food chain within the justice system, have the ability to move, to put in place new policies and new ways of looking at systems that actually can make it so that individual biases run up against systemic change. And that's what we want to do. So we need to focus on changing systems rather than uh, individuals because we are gonna have a hard time uh, to undermine uh, bias in system, I mean, individuals, but we might be able to undermine it in cultures. Next slide, please. What else can they do? They can set concrete goals to eliminate bias and work towards those goals. So when we recognize that sometimes we don't even know what we know, what we, what we don't know that is, we can make better decisions. So one of the ways that we do that is developing data so we can finally know what we don't know. And that makes a world of difference because once you know the decisions that you've been making have disadvantage one group over another, then you can put in place things that will change that. Next slide, please. So judges can also recognize that people are much more likely to act their way out of a way into a new way of thinking than to think their way into a new way of acting. So again, when things are put in place that allow for us to actually have a system that people have to comply with, if they comply with that, after a while, their thinking may change. Next slide, please. So most importantly, uh, next slide, please. Yes. So most importantly, courts must enforce procedural fairness. Next slide, please. So I put together a mnemonic device to help you understand what procedural fairness is. So the first is respect. Obviously, if you give respect, you can most often expect to get respect back. And people respond positively to the court when they see that the court respects them. Next. The second is understanding. People need to understand what's going on. I can't tell you the number of times as a lawyer that I had clients who came and uh, went to court with me and after we left, wanted to know what happened. 
obviously we didn't do a good job of explaining that process and courts can do a better job of doing that. Next, please. The third is neutrality. It's clear that if people come into a courtroom and determine what they think is a fixed game, that they're not gonna respect the court system. So courts have to work assiduously and constantly to make sure that everybody perceives that what they're doing is neutral, that the decisions were not made before they walked through the door. Next, please. The last and probably the most important is voice. When people come to court, many times, the only thing that they want is an opportunity to be heard. And even if they lose, research shows that if they feel that those things are in place, that is respect, understanding, neutrality, and voice, that they'll accept even adverse decisions. And even sometimes when they get a positive decision, if those things were not present, they will not respect the system. So the mnemonic is run V, respect, understanding, neutrality, and voice. Next slide, please. So procedural fairness is not just actual fairness. It also includes the perception of fairness. Next slide, please. When I say the perception of fairness, I'm talking about the fact that people have to believe in the system in order to invest in the system uh, that which will take them to a place that makes them feel as though they actually can get justice. And justice really is all about fairness, just like fairness is really all about justice. Thank you. Thank you so much for those remarks. I, I'm sure lots of panelists and um, audience members are gonna have questions. But next up, let's move to Kyle Strickland. Kyle, do you wanna start your remarks? Of course, of course. I don't need a slide, so feel free to open the screen. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Uh, thanks so much, Judge. That, that was a fantastic overview, systemic racism, the role of bias and how it plays in the courts and where we are um, today. And, you know, I wanted to take a moment first to just thank the Ohio Fair Courts Alliance, Common Cause Ohio, Freedom Block, Ohio Council of Churches, ACLU, and NAACP. And thank you so much, Tom Roberts, for that wonderful introduction. Um, we are at a critical moment um, right now um, in our country, and we have to reckon uh, with this history. Um, and so when we talk about race, law, democracy, and the courts, we have to talk about how these issues are connected. Just as the judge just spoke, he talks about the ways in which systemic racism is very different than implicit or individual biases. And here's why that's important. For the past 50 years or so, and today, we are living in a reality in which people believe that racism is simply a byproduct of individual overt animus or discrimination. So they think that people using racial slurs or the KKK, those are the types of egregious actions that we will not tolerate in society. However, what we often ignore is how systemic racism continues to lead to significant racial disparities. And so that's why we see economic and racial disparities in all sorts of domains. It's why we see on nearly every indicator from health to wealth to more broader indicators of the economy, we see black and brown communities that are left behind systemically time and time again. And some people see those issues and say, well, perhaps that has to do with some sort of fault of their own, or perhaps that has to do with some sort of cultural deficit or cultural problem. But we have to reject that flat out because the facts are that instead of blaming the systems and the structures and the policies that continue to persist in unequal outcomes time and time again, people try to blame individuals and blame entire communities. But what happens when we do that? Well, we avoid responsibility for solving these systems of inequality. And we also place the blame on communities and leave communities behind. And so what happens? What does that mean to where we are today? Well, we are in a post-civil rights era, of course. However, we have not achieved the types of justice and equity that we'd like to see. That's why we saw the uprisings in 2020 fighting against these systems of police brutality, but also 
systems that continue to leave black and brown voices behind. And too often, people see these issues as zero sum. They think that when we talk about race and racial injustice in this country, that somehow we can't talk about these issues without it being, quote unquote, too divisive. So what they decide to do is say, well, let's not talk about these issues at all. But what happens when we ignore these issues, when we don't talk about these issues, the vacuum is filled with the most hateful rhetoric. And so what happens then is that instead of uh, talking and confronting of the legacy of racism and discrimination in our country, we ignore that history. And then there are those who instead are trying to delete and erase that very same history we're talking about. And so what happens when we erase history? Well, we lose sight of the very real threats to our democracy. Right now, 2021, going on 22, we have very real and urgent threats to our democracy right now. This is not theoretical. This is not abstract. There are real attacks that are happening on our democracy, and we have not done enough to raise the alarm. You and I might have, in our individual communities, we might be fighting, we might be talking about these issues. However, many federal policymakers and others are still standing idly by while these t attacks continue. And why is this important? Well, this historical context is key. So one is this, our multiracial democracy that we have today is only about 60 or so years old after the 1965 Voting Rights Act it is a relatively new concept. There are people who see the country's history and think that perhaps we are on some inevitable path of progress. We saw the progress that happens in the civil rights era. And so now we are slowly but surely having that path towards a more perfect union. But that path is not inevitable. And in fact, right now we are facing the very real assault on our democracy because we have gotten complacent in the face of the injustices that we see. So what do we do about that? Well, one, we have to reckon with our history. We have to call this injustice out, as the judge just mentioned. We have to talk about this because without reckoning with that history, we lose sight of how we got here and where we are to go moving forward. And, he, and here's why. Right now, you have people who are saying that only certain people uh, are allowed to vote and everybody else uh, uh, is not having the same opportunities and responsibilities as everybody else and you're hearing under the guise of voter fraud and all sorts of things like that as a reason to exclude your voice. These were the same lies, the same messages that people were pushing after the Reconstruction era and are pushing to usher in an era of Jim Crow. And what we are seeing today can be considered a Jim Crow 2.0. Now, people don't like when you talk about these issues because perhaps they say, they say we have achieved the racial equality, we have the Civil Rights Act, we have the Voting Rights Act, but what you don't talk about is the very real undermining of the Voting Rights Act that we're seeing right now, right here today. Many of you, I've seen some of you on this call, I know some of you on this call, who have been fighting for fair maps, for example, who have been fighting for your ability to have your voices heard. And why this connects to the courts is because all of these issues are interconnected. If we are not confronting the disparities that are facing our democracy, then we are not gonna be confronting racial justice. No longer can we say racial justice is an issue over here. Economic justice is an issue over here. These are connected to issues of our democracy. And especially when we talk about multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy moving forward. There are very real people who say we don't need a multiracial democracy and perhaps we only need uh, the power of the handful of the very few who can make decisions for the rest of us. Sadly, that's what we're seeing in state legislatures all across the country where we're having single party power, one party rule, and instead of having the voices of our democracy represented. So what does that do? Well, that creates disillusionment. It creates despair. And it creates this sense that perhaps doing the things that are required to tackle these systemic issues, that perhaps we're trying to do too much. And instead, incremental change uh, is all we can ask for. But we cannot fall into that trap. Incremental change is not enough to address the solution, the crises that we face today. 
right now from climate change to immigrant justice to black liberation. These are issues that require everybody to lean in on, to fight for the issues on behalf of everybody. And at the heart of that is our democracy. But we have to reckon with our history. We have to speak truth to power. And we can't lose sight over the roles that we have as individuals to play. Because that is part of the strategy of those who believe that they are going to be fighting against democracy. There are those who say, well, perhaps you should just sit by and sit back and the powers and the forces that be are just too much for us to overcome. But we can overcome it. Let's not just look to our history and see those who fought for our democracy, who fought for racial justice, who fought for freedom and think that that was just a thing of the past. We are in that moment right now. It is alarming. It is concerning. It is frightening. In many days, it's challenging and you sometimes lose hope. But right here, every single day, it is people like the people on this call who are making their voices heard, who are sounding the alarm and trying to speak to those in power to listen to everyday people who are trying to fight for every single person to have a voice in this democracy in this country. That's what this is all about. And so don't lose sight of that fight. And when you are in despair, when you think that nothing is possible, just know about all the people who are doing the work every single day. To know that until we achieve justice, that we have to continue to call out these systems and accountability is key to that. We know that these disparities continue to persist as the judge just spoke about all throughout our court system. We know that the disparities of getting uh, arrested or getting incarcerated are much more likely uh, if you're a person of color because of these systemic inequalities. These disparities exist throughout the justice system, throughout the, our criminal, uh, cl criminal legal system, throughout the healthcare system and beyond. And we have to put up a fight against that because otherwise we will allow this history to continue over and over again. And we cannot see to that. So I close on this. At the end of the day, we have to build more systems of democratic power in our communities, voices of democracy where individuals have the voices to say every single day that we are gonna fight for our community, not just on behalf of our communities, but even for those who don't look like us. And I hope you all will check out uh, Heather McGee's The Sum of Us, who talks about this view that we have around racial inequality and racial equity in this country. They're those who see it as a zero-sum game, who think that the gains and progress for some that may not look like you is somehow an attack on everybody else. That's just not true. We are stronger when we are together. And so let's not repeat uh, the history of the past where in the some of us, what she talks about is how in the 50s, we saw all of this growth, the middle class in America and all this growth, you would see these public swimming pools all across the country. But once you had to integrate those swimming pools, people, instead of integrating those pools, decided to drain the entire pool. And that hurts all of us. Racism costs all of us, and we are seeing that happen today. And so we have to explain to people that calling for racial justice, calling for a multiracial democracy, is not about just not talking about the issues because we're afraid of being too divisive. It's saying that we will not ignore injustice because us ignoring the injustice has been us becoming too comfortable with our own privileges and with our everyday society. We will not accept the status quo. We will fight back against this, but we need every single one of you in this fight for our, our democracy, and we have to do it together, but it requires action, and I hope you all do it together. So thank you so much for this panel. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm looking forward to everyone's questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle. That was very inspirational, and I appreciate you sounding the alarm and getting us all fired up. Um, I think we got the good group here to, to make some action happen. Um, how about we move on to Raymond Green? Ray, why don't you tell us your remarks? Um, good evening. It's a blessing to be here with this um, distinguished panel. Um, um, Judge um, Adrian, uh, pleasure to be here with you. Kyle brought that fire i just want to um, um reiterate um and add on to what kyle said um you know we, we got to bring the heat we got to bring we got to bring us um we have to um not think about this on a macro level 
and we have to begin real small on a micro level. Uh, we have to begin to talk to our neighbors. Um, a lot of us are in this fight um, and, and we're going home um, after fighting this fight and our neighbors are voting against the thing that we're fighting against. Um, and we have to begin to organize in a 10 block radius. We begin have to begin to organize um, and talk to people inside of our precinct and understand what our precinct looks like and what's inside of our precinct. That begins to allow us to build a system of accountability. Um, that system of accountability begins to influence the court system, influence the voting system. Uh, we begin to find leaders inside of our, our, our own community that can run for office. Um, but we have to do this at a micro level. Um, our voices inside of that small community have to become one and unite outside of that community to a redrawn out um, those that are against community. Um, the policy that we're seeing coming out now, um, anti-CRT um, and, and, and things like that, that's against the, 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 the community that we live in. That's against the community that we know that we are building. Um, but but the people inside that community aren't able to fight because we aren't we aren't asking them to fight. We aren't inviting them to the fight. And we aren't getting their voices involved in what's going on. And we have to begin to get in the voices of everyone involved um, to where they understand what's going on in the system, what's going on on a block, what's going on in the state house um, at a level that affects them on an everyday basis. Um, and that's how we begin to change this. That's how we begin to influence our courts. Um, that's how we begin to influence our schools. That's how we have get our children involved to where their voices are heard. But ultimately, that's how we begin to build up the bench that we need. Um, we, we can no longer continue to just raise lawyers and, 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 and raise football players and athletes. We have to raise cabinet members. Um, cabinet members are the ones that's making the policies. Um, there's somebody on our, black, on our block right now that could be a cabinet member that can take our ideas, take our sentiment, take our struggles um, into a cabinet position. Um, but we don't understand the cabinet. So we don't teach our kids and raise our kids to understand the, 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 what the cabinet could do. Because the cabinet does all the research. The cabinet does all the work um, and does all the research and creates all the policies. Um, and they're the ones that bring that, that gets close to the public. So if we're building those people inside of our community, inside of our 10 block radius, we begin to have a different voice um, and local government at the state house and at the federal level. Um, and those are the things that we gotta start doing um, on, a, on a micro level um, and not just thinking about a macro level, but we have to start small right inside of our community. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate the um, the inspiring inspiring words to think about how we can really start small so that we're not overwhelmed um, because these are really large tasks ahead of us if we're gonna try to infiltrate white supremacy and make all of our systems more fair, whether it's education or healthcare, or criminal justice. Uh, should we move on now to Maria? Maria, do you wanna share some of your remarks, comments? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Um, I have so many things to say that are all over the place, but I wanted to start by saying something that will probably sound weird, which is I am clearly the only white person on this panel. And I think that's really important to name because I think we try to, especially as uh, plenty of the white people on this call, um, you know, it, it's an uncomfortable thing to name and it shouldn't be and it need not be. And I think it's important to point that out too, because if there's anything I've learned in organizing spaces and in the legal system, it's you have to appreciate the limitations of your perspective on stuff. And you shouldn't be speaking for other people. There are plenty of people speaking for themselves and you can elevate their voices. Um, but I will never fully understand what it's like to live in black skin every day. And I will never pretend that I do. Uh, but I think as white folks, so I am sort of speaking more to the white people on this call, I think for, you know, as white people involved in this fight, I think it's important to constantly be reminding yourself that your experience in the world is very different than folks who don't look like you. Um, there are things that they have to worry about that you don't. Uh, you know, when a, one, one thing that stands out to me is, you know, when there's a, a white man who's a little late coming home, you're like, oh, well, maybe he got caught off at the bar. When a black man's late, home, late for coming home, you have also that anxiety of, I hope he didn't get pulled over. I hope something bad didn't happen. I hope he wasn't victim to the law. 
And I think it's important to note that the law is a social contract that was decided upon by a bunch of white male property owners. That's who, that's who did drafted the first round of that social contract. And as we've tried to accommodate other people, we've tried to edit our version of that contract to sufficiently accommodate the diverse group that is now at that negotiation table. But we're not nearly there yet. Um, and I think that ends up sort of treating people of color. They end up experiencing death by a thousand cuts. Um, I worked at the public defender's office. And one thing that I think I noticed, noticed like nearly immediately was the connection between poverty and the justice system, the connection between race and the justice system. And it's very transparent. When you enter a courtroom, the lawyers are mostly white, the defendants are mostly black. That is not a, you know, that is a, pro, uh, a product of the system that was designed for and on behalf of and by white people. And so I think it's important to be constantly pushing ourselves to be getting new decision makers and to be editing and reevaluating the law. And I think as white people, we will need to constantly push ourselves, challenge ourselves, challenge our friends, challenge our family, family to reevaluate our version of justice. Um, we tend to think about it and pop culture tends to think about it. And you know, um, our default setting tends to think about the law as something that should be punitive, something that should punish people so they know what they did wrong, um, rather than a more victim focused um, system. And so instead of worrying about making that victim whole, making sure that that person is uh, taken care of, we are focusing on making sure this person is on the other side of that is punished. And, and the reason that that matters is because we also have already had all of the white people decide what should be punished altogether. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't prosecute wage theft. We don't prosecute when a boss keeps money from, from their employees, but we do prosecute every, you know, single, um, uh, shoplifting. I've seen people stay in jail for a, stealing a single Gatorade. That was an actual fact pattern that came through the court when I was there. Um, I have seen judges who become prosecutors pretty much once they are on the bench. I mean, uh, when you look at the Rittenhouse case, I think that was a lot of especially white people's first exposure to seeing those, the vastness of those injustices um, by a judge who has already made up his mind about the situation. Uh, before the court, before the case had even started, he had already decided that the people could not be called victims. They had to, but they could be called looters. Um, and that was a decision that the judge made. And that was the judge framing the entire uh, playing field before anyone had started the game. And so the judges can make a bunch of decisions like that. The prosecutors can make a bunch of decisions like that. And cumulatively, it ends up with slightly higher bail, slightly longer sentences slightly you know, more parole uh, obligations, um, less benefit of the doubt, more likelihood for mistake. Cross uh, racial identification is the lowest quality uh, identification with regards to witness testimonies. And yet often uh, all of these um, cases where someone ends up exonerated, it's because a white person was cross identifying towards a black person and just decided it was close enough. Um, and those are the types of errors that disproportionately pu punish people of color. So as far as what, as, as, as lawyers or non-lawyers, as white people, you know, what do we do about kind of helping out? The first is you're probably surrounded by a bunch of other white people. You can talk to them. Um, you can try to uh, direct them to listen to more uh, Black voices who have written about this topic, who have made movies about this topic, documentaries. Um, there is plenty of material in all shapes and sizes for, for white folks to begin reading up, reading up on all of these diverse perspectives. Um, we also can be critical of our judicial candidates. It's something that I think people, and, and prosecutorial candidates, that's also really important. Um, that can be uh, something that people overlook because it's not covered in the sort of mud fight of the you know, uh, Republican versus Democrat. But the thing about judges is once they're in, they really are supposed to be and should be autonomous entities. And so it's the campaign process where we can decide whether a judge is holding themselves to a high enough standard to deserve to be that in that position. Um, and that's going to happen through actually paying attention to judicial races, actually going to judicial forums, 
um, asking tough questions, looking at the donation lists. Um, know that a lot of uh, corporations, et cetera, will donate to both candidates. But if you know all of, say, the energy corporations are giving this one side 10 grand and no money to the other side, there's probably a reason for that. Um, and so maybe you know contemplate what that reason might be. So there are different ways that you can at least get a sense for a judge's disposition and a judge's um, potential favoritism through how they're presenting themselves through the campaign process. Um, it's also important to note that um, judges are really sheltered. I mean, they're largely affluent, they're largely white, they're largely people who, you know, came from and have lived in predominantly white spaces. I can't tell you how many judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys have never been in the inside of a jail or prison where they're sending people, um, which is wild to me. I really think that that should be absolutely mandatory for every single judge, prosecutor, and defense attorney to see the inside of the jail and prison where they are sending people. Um, but that's just an example of how we tend to be out of sight, out of mind. And we need to not be. So we have to constantly be challenging ourselves to reevaluate the social contract and make sure that um, diverse voices are being elevated and that we are constantly pushing ourselves to better the law and better the group of people who are enforcing the law. Thank you, Maria. Those were really great um, insights. And I appreciate you speaking to the white people in the room and calling out the elephants in the room. Um, all right, I think this is the fun part where we get to open it up to some of the questions and hear what's on folks' mind. Um, so if you haven't already put questions into the chat, please do so and we'll start to sort through those. Um, but I have some already. Um, one that we received is for Judge Adrian. Um, Judge Adrian, the request was, could you speak more to, about how you would surface biases, um, biases in the court systems? You know, change, generally speaking, comes from the top. And that being the case, um, if you are in a position where you can exercise uh, some systemic change, you have to make it know that, known that that's what you want to do. And, and I used to tell folks, you know, there was an old commercial years ago, uh, uh, a brokerage co company used to have this commercial that said, uh, you know, when Ia Putin speaks, everyone listens. Now, it didn't work out real well for Ia Putin because they went out of business, but when judges speak, everyone tends to listen because they're at the top of the food chain and they set the tone and they can make it known uh, what they're going to accept and what they're not going to accept from not just those who work in the courthouse, but who those, those who visit the courthouse, uh, whether they be litigants, whether they be uh, lawyers, whether they be police officers, you know, everybody takes their clue from that judicial officer and they can set the tone and they can start the ball rolling with regard to systemic change. Well, and Kyle, I have a question for you. You know, one of the things that we started out with had to do with kind of our vision, you know, our Fair Courts Alliance vision for, you know, what's justice, what is it that we want to see in our courts? And I thought it would be interesting to hear from each, each of the panelists a little bit about like what their vision is and what is one area that they think needs a lot of attention right now. And we'll start with you, Kyle. That's a great... Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, so, so the first, you know, you know, one immediate thing that I think we're seeing right now, especially federally, uh, but these courts need to be reflective of the communities they serve, right? And we need to make sure that we're diversifying those who are on the bench, those who are represented. That also means addressing the pipeline of those who are involved uh, in, in the legal system more broadly, um, to know that there is a path for those to be involved and there is a path uh, for positions of power. Um, I think that is an, an important aspect of this. However, uh, that is not nearly the types of systemic changes uh, that you that you need. You also need a bolder changes to the ways in which our institutions work all across the board. And when it comes to the courts, um, we have to be talking about bigger institutional changes. Um, we have to be talking about at the very uh, highest level uh, when we talk about the Supreme Court, 
because of the politicization that we are seeing within our court system right now, um, you have to be serious about court reform. I personally would, would believe that an expansion of the, the Supreme Court is a move that uh, should be taken to make sure, sure that you have more representation on that, rec- on that court, that it's more reflective, and that people can trust uh, that you are having a court that is not making judges base- or making decisions based on political agendas, but rather on the law and on trust and justice and fairness. And there are those who scream and say, no, no, we... You know, we we can't make these big, quote unquote, radical changes to our institutions. And yet, at the same time, uh, when it comes to federal legislation, those types of things, we are seeing it requires a supermajority to get anything passed. And yet state legislatures and state after state are passing things on simple majorities to roll back things like voting rights. That is unacceptable. So you have to do things like institutional reform, court reform, uh, ending the filibuster. These are the types of changes that you can make at the federal level, and you can reform all across the court systems as well. Thank you. Well, thank you. And then, Ray, if you could tell us a little bit about kind of the vision that you have for justice and the courts and, you know, the, what you think we should be looking at and working on right now. Um. So right now, so there's a couple of things we can do right now, and that's jury reform. Um, jury um, reconstruction, jury reform um, will um, help solve a lot of our problems in the court system. Um, automatic voter registration, um, automatic um, license push you in the pool for jury. Um, and then we pay jury people. Um, we pay them um, the wages they're going to they gonna miss or a living wage. Um, Black people historically don't be on juries. We dodge jury duty. Um, And the main reason why is for economic reasons. We can't afford to miss work. Um, So our juries, when we go to court, our juries don't look like us. We're not being judged by a jury of our peers that understand our economic constraints. The second thing we do is is decriminalize poverty. Decriminalize poverty. Um, um, build a system of accountability inside of our communities, um, get rid of um, laws that punish people for survival. Um, and, and that creates a different kind of a court system. Um, and then we got to raise, um, we got to create a system of accountability that affects the court system, that influences the court system. Um, carceral punishment is not the way to go. Um, it doesn't reintegrate people back into the community. It doesn't take into account um, the harms that was done to that person before they um, got convicted. Um, and we need to create a system of accountability inside of our communities that allows the courts, that allows us to dictate to the courts what happens to each um, individual that commits what we call a crime. Um, and then de- redefine crime. I don't even like saying that word because I think people that steal, I don't think they're, they're criminals. Um, I think the fact that they have to steal is criminals is criminal. Um, the fact that we don't have a living wage, the fact that we give so much money to the food bank instead of giving money to people, instead of giving food to people, I think that's criminal. So when someone steals to feed their family, I don't think that's criminal. Um, so we have to have a better system of accountability um, and decriminalize poverty. Thank you. Well, and thank you. So Maria, you're the next batter up. Tell us a little bit about your vision for justice and what are the kinds of reforms you'd like to see us all working on right now? So many. Um, I did see this comment in the chat, so I will uh, second it. But the Electoral College is one of those things that people sleep on. Like if even if we didn't even get rid of it, but we went to proportional distribution from states, like that would be a total game changer. Um, The fact that the way electoral colleges works, it really does manipulate a lot of different aspects of our democracy. So uh, I agree. Um, But yeah, I think voting rights needs to be a top priority. It's the foundational element to preserve all of the other things. And if people can't participate, then other people can fix the game. So first and foremost, national uh, voting rights uh, legislation needs to be like a top priority in everyone's mind. You need to be bugging the heck out of everyone that you know that could possibly be helpful in making that happen. Um, and part of that is making public awareness for the importance of it, you know, whatever. It, it might come in several different forms, but I also think that a lot of that work does have, happen locally. Um, evaluate your local prosecutor, 
see what the criminal justice system is actually looking like in your own um, environment and consider how it could be better. I, th I think community policing is something that's like super important. I think the idea that people don't live in the areas they serve is really bad. I mean, like, how do you know about the social norms? I personally have lived in an underserved, predominantly black neighborhood in downtown Columbus. And I've also lived in Medina, Ohio, in the suburb that I grew up in. Um, our police interactions are very different. And it's because the police in the small town are people that whose kids I go to school with. Um, whereas, you know, in these uh, lower income neighborhoods, in these underserved neighborhoods, we have people that are coming from the suburbs, and then just kind of, you know, come in with their SWAT gear. And like, that's not actual safety for anyone. Um, and so I think reevaluating how we actually police cities is top, top tier priority. Well, and Judge Adrian, that leaves you for the last, uh, your, your vision for the courts. I think you laid out, you know, some, uh, uh, the sense of, of all of the struggles and the things we need to do, but I'm really interested in kind of your vision for the courts and what you would like to see folks do now. Catherine, you know, I mean, I listened to the other panelists and, and to be frank with you, it just makes me take a deep sigh because, uh, just uh, as was uh, stated by Maria, you know, all of this is based in voting. Something that we haven't been able to convince the majority of folks in our community that's essential to their well being on every level. All of the things that they just talked about could be changed in a heartbeat if, in fact, we had majorities or super majorities uh, at, at uh, the Congress. Um, in the Senate, without those, we're we're stymied. You know, I'd love to see uh, there be changes in the way that we go about dealing with people who uh, have committed offenses. Something that would be more realistic and would uh, understand that the vast majority of those folks, better than ninety percent of them, are ultimately going to go back into the community uh, that they're taken away from but they're gonna go back with fewer skills and, and fewer prospects than they, are, they went, that, than they had when they went in. And, and so as a result, you know, all we really do when we send people to jail for crimes is to run the risk of making better criminals, not making people better, okay? So, I mean, it would be great if we could come up with ways to deal with that. It would be great if uh, every community would take a hard look at how they go about pretrial detention and understand that even as few as three days in jail can destroy a person's life for, forever. You know, that they suffer what's known as cumulative disadvantages from even those kind of short periods of incarceration. And there's just a cascade of things that happen. The thing with regard to judges uh, is that that too is based in voting. You know, you look at most of these communities and people of color, regardless of what their resume may be, have a very difficult time reaching the bench when they, when they could, the only way that they can get there, especially in Ohio, when you have, you know, Republican uh, legislators and governors, uh, the only way that you can get there is if you can get enough votes. And there are so many uh, communities that have uh, no people of color on the bench. There are only 50 currently uh, out of 721 uh, who on, on all benches in you know, the state of Ohio. And that's not likely to change much moving forward because you can't get it done. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm frustrated uh, and I recognize that we have to try to be realistic in what we think about when we think about, okay, what would we like to see? Because what I would like to see and what I'm likely to see are not the same thing. What has to happen is that we have to be able to make the connection for the people that we are concerned about between uh, what they want to see happen in their lives, in their daily lives, and the necessity for them to put in place people who are gonna be accountable to them because they know that they put them in there and they could take them out. 
Well, those were all really insightful and um, thoughtful responses. I'm kind of wondering about, you know, what do we what do we say? Can we can we talk more about how racism hurts us all and um, how we can start to con how we can start to convince our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, um, you know, maybe people of completely different political persuasions that building a stronger democracy is in all of our self interests. I think Kyle, I think you spoke a little bit to that in your remarks. Did you want to lead off lead us off on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and it's a great question. You know, I think we, we really do have to change the way, at least in the mainstream, we think about racism and racial inequality. We, we really do have to move away from this idea that it's only, you know, the people using the most racist slurs and all sorts of things like that. It really is embedded uh, within our systems and with our institutions. We have to tell that history. We, we have to tell the truth. We have to reckon with that history and make clear that talking about the ugly parts of our country's history uh, doesn't mean that you hate the, your country, but instead you are talking about the ways in which we can progress and move forward together. And that for too many of us, we're still left behind. And, and I think the way you do that is talking about your lived experiences and also to talk about the, the privileges that you have, right? Based on your identities, based on um, your perspectives in our society and explain that at the same time that you might have a particular privilege or you might get the benefits within society that we still have too many systems that leave too many of us behind. And I, I think the way you have to do that is by talking not only about your lived experiences, but about the shared journey we can make together on this. And that's why I think talking about things like the sum of us, I think are really important. Talking about if we really believe in the principles of equality, of equity, of justice, then why is it that we continue to see disparities that we see today and really talk about how we got here? Um, so it's not enough to just say access and opportunity for all when we know in reality, access and opportunity is not the reality for most people. And instead we have to talk about equitable outcomes. And the way you do that is tying these issues together. Talk about racial justice in connection with economic justice, and then talk about it in connection with our democracy. I'm telling you this, a lot of people don't realize that the direct, directly counter to a white supremacist, nativist rhetoric that we're seeing today is a multiracial, multi-ethnic inclusive democracy. That is at the heart directly counter to what we're trying to fight against because we are trying to say everybody should have a voice regardless of background, regardless of what you look like and where you're from. You have a voice in this country and our democracy and we have to do this together. It's not going to be easy. There will always be people who, will, who don't want to talk about race, who don't want to talk about racism. And instead, they'll say, well, let's just not talk about it. I don't want to get upset. You have to say, I'm speaking for my experiences, and I'm going to speak for my values and what I believe in. And I hope you join me in this fight. And some people are just not going to get there. And that's OK. But there are a lot of us and a lot of people in this country that don't quite, they're not quite there yet but we can still meet them where they are and get us in the direction of where we need to be. And I, you do that as a journey we take together. I also just wanna quickly add, um, again, sort of speaking from the white perspective here, um, a quote that I find myself repeating a lot is when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And I think that that is something that's really important to remember as white allies in this space that people expect it to never be uncomfortable. They think that we can fix this without any discomfort. And that's just never gonna be what it is. It's gonna be really hard conversations. It's gonna be confronting past mistakes. It's reevaluating assumptions that you made about the world. Um, you know, you, you have to be willing to get uncomfortable. You have to be willing to make other people around you uncomfortable. Um, and there is like a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Like you go through that discomfort and then you learn and then you grow and then you can appreciate everything a little bit more from there on out. Um, and you just have to keep being willing to grow and reevaluate your assumptions. Yeah, I, I, I think we have to um, educate. Uh, we have to first educate um, on how this country was built. Um, and then we must not, we must understand where we live at. Um, I know it becomes sexy um, to talk about race 
Um, but we live in Ohio. We must talk about race and class. Um, when you talk about race and class, then you begin to cross that racial line into poor white people and, and begin to understand the system better. But then we must point the finger at capitalism um, that makes resources scarce, that keeps a competitive type of um, country moving. Um, so when you're competing for jobs and you wanna talk about race, now you're talking about a black person taking a job from a white person, instead of talking about the scarcity of jobs and even more scarcity of living wage jobs, because um, you're creating competition for limited resources when we live in the richest country in the world with plenty of resources. Um, so we have to address capitalism. Um, you can't address racism without addressing capitalism. And then you can't do that in Ohio without addressing classism. Um, and then you begin to build a larger community of people that's going through the same things that now can no longer blame each other because we're having this real conversation around capitalism. Um, with a race class narrative on it. Um, but let's understand like the reason why we're going through the things that we're going through, whether it be because of race or whatever, is because the scarcity of resources. So if the people that built this country that we give credit for building this country, white people feel like they're gonna use their re lose their resources, their natural inkling to is to fight. And we have to understand that. Um, so we have to address that we have the richest country in the world and we are holding resources and making people compete for resources. Um, and I think that's how we begin to address, address racism, address inequality um, in our systems and in Ohio. And Judge, I have a question for you. Um, and this has to do with the Ohio Black Judges Association. You know. Mm -hmm wondered a little bit about how your association came together and then i'm interested in are there specific policies or legislation that your association is working on right now well the ohio black judges association really was formed this year and it was formed basically because two of our uh judges uh were approached about doing something to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the National Judicial Council, which is the judicial bar, uh, the judicial uh, branch of the National Bar Association. The National Bar Association, of course, was formed back in the day when black lawyers couldn't join the American Bar Association because of race. And of course, the National Judicial Council was there because there was no organization that really uh, spoke to the issues of black judges. So when they saw that, that they were going to uh, celebrate the um, 50th anniversary, they started thinking about the fact that there was no organization of Black judges in Ohio. And they formulated uh, the Ohio Black Judges Association uh, to take a look at that. As a matter of fact, if, if you uh, go uh, online tonight, you can probably find a link I wish I had the, the technical capacity, but there's uh, the national, I mean, the Ohio Black Judges Association is having a, a CLE tomorrow, it's free, uh, that would uh, kind of get you into what they're thinking about now as it relates to uh, race and uh, justice and the judicial role. Uh, I think that you'd find that really interesting. It's the, their third of three uh sections that they've had as far as CLE this year. As far as what they are looking at uh, and trying to push, they've really gotten behind uh, Chief Justice uh, Maureen O'Connor's uh, initiative to try to establish a, as a threshold a criminal sentencing database. And the Chief Justice has made really clear that she thinks that putting a database together as it relates to sentencing should be just the first place where we start to, to garner information. That we also ought to be taking a look at it as it relates to um, uh, pretrial detention, uh, plea bargaining, uh, trials, uh, death penalty, all kinds of things where we haven't been collecting data. There's been a lot of pushback from judges who don't really want to see 
uh, that kind of a thing come into place. Uh, most of them are, are probably trying to do the right thing, but they're scared of what it's going to look like because they know how many people of color are coming through their courtroom. And I always tell them that it really isn't important uh, how many people that you ultimately end up uh, incarcerating from the standpoint of the number of people who come into your courthouse because you can only deal with you can only deal with what you're presented. What's important is are you making disparate kinds of judgments as it relates to people who are people of color as opposed to people who are white for the same type of offense. You know, as far as who comes into the courtroom, that's something that pretty much is determined by the police and by the legislature. But as far as judges are concerned, you know, they just have to deal with what's in front of them. And so if they're doing the right thing, then they shouldn't be scared. And if they are scared, then they've got a bigger problem. Well, and I wanted to say thank you to Judge Trapp for throwing in uh, the link. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, it's just in the chat. And so uh, if you're looking for CLEs and an interesting discussion, that's something that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, Camille, did you have another question? Oh uh, yeah, looks like we have a question about what can we do about getting people out to vote? Um, you know, I, we know that Ray Green has had a lot of success in getting people out to vote. So how do we overcome that obstacle? And how do we overcome this obstacle that we have with this redistricting crunch that we're in where we see that uh, black and brown communities are being cracked and packed into districts and their voices and, and, and minority communities are be, really being diluted. How do we overcome those obstacles? It's difficult, uh, especially with the redistricting thing because we don't have our fingers or our hands on any of the levers of power that allow for that. We can only hope that the Ohio Supreme Court and Congress uh, do something that allow us to at least overcome some of the disadvantages. And if they don't, we're stuck with that for the next 10 years. You know, so, and as far as getting people out to vote, you know, this is a, an ongoing problem that we have to have. We need to be, as, uh, you know, Brother Strickland said, we've got to be raising our voice to everybody who will listen and find in new and, and more creative ways of getting the message out. And we have to come up with a better message because right now, you know, if you talk to, uh, I would I would garner to say a majority of black folks, uh, what you're gonna hear when you try to talk to them about voting, they're gonna say, you know, yeah, well, you know, it don't matter, you know, my vote don't matter, you know. And I try to tell folks, I said, you know, I know that you may not feel that you have anything to vote for, I said, but sometimes you're put in a position where you have to understand that you have to have things that you vote against. You know? And either way, there's no such thing as not going to vote because politics may be the dirtiest game in town, but it's also the only game in town. And either you play it or you have, have it played on you. And unfortunately, we've been uh, allowing people to play it on us for too long. Maria, I know you've done a lot of civic engagement work. What do you do? You have anything to say about um, motivating folks? Yeah, I think you know. I used to work in doing get out the vote things uh, with my former organization, and we were in the non nonpartisan realm. And the reason that I I liked that so much is that we were not coming from the standpoint of being a candidate asking for favors from people. We were really coming in to provide a service that is helping them find out their own ballot decide on issues that they care about um, and let them lead the conversation. So I think if you are doing recruiting and get out the vote, it's really important that this stays about the people that you're talking to, uh, about what they need, about what they want, uh, you know, reminding them that it's important, absolutely. Especially I think with young people, there's like a particular sense of hopelessness. Um, I think it's exactly what Judge said is really important. Sometimes you are voting to mitigate something that could be way worse if you don't show up. Um, and I think that that cannot be understated. No one wants to be, you know, convincing people to vote out of fear, but it's also just the reality of the circumstance where if there is a candidate that doesn't see you as a whole person, you should probably make sure that that candidate stays out of office. Um, and so I think it's really important to, uh, for folks who are more reluctant or feel a little bit more hopeless to understand um, that 
the importance of that. Um, as far as redistricting, I do want to note um, the maps as they are currently were all passed strictly on partisan lines, which means um, regardless of the litigation, these will be four year maps. Um, and why that matters specifically is because the makeup of the redistricting commission includes uh, three statewide offices that are all up for reelection next year. So we could potentially out of a panel of seven replace three of those members without doing anything other than voting for a different person. Um, and so when those maps come around in four years, they could be a whole different group of people um, drawing them. So I, I always want to remind people of that because I think there's, you know, as the sense that like once it's done and there's nothing I can keep doing to, to mitigate it and, you know, we can at least shorten the period of time uh, that these are governing our um, state. So those would be the couple things I would note. Yeah, we have to um, we have to connect voting to people's everyday lives. Um, people are um, suffering. People are starving. People are getting evicted from their home from their homes. Um, um, you know, people are losing their jobs. Um, the 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 last thing they're thinking about is voting. Um, and then the way we talk about voting, we talk about it in voting for the president, uh, which is so detached from their everyday lives. Um, we have to begin local education campaigns around voting um, and tie it to their everyday well-being, help them understand why they're getting evicted. That's a local law. Those are local judges that are evicting you. Those are local people that are affecting your lives every day. Um, and we got to build leadership out inside of that um, component um, to where we're running candidates um, from a grassroots level that turns people out. Um, and, and we have to stop being reactionary. We have to have something on the ballot every year, whatever the ballot initiative is, whatever we got to do, we have to have something on the ballot that speaks to the people that's going to turn the people out. Um, we can we cannot continue to come through this thing as a, as a victim, um, particularly the people on this call, if we're calling ourselves leaders. Um, we have to be proactive. Um, we're, 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 we, you know, I've been putting things on the ballot for the last three years. Um, we have to speak to every people's everyday lives if we want them to turn out to vote. Uh, we cannot lo no longer tell people our ancestors died for you to have the right to vote. Uh, first of all, it's a lie. Our ancestors were murdered and killed um, for the right to vote. Um, but we're still in the situation that we're in even through that. Um, so we have to recognize that. Um, and we have to recognize that, 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 that the ways that we have failed um, in voting to be able to educate and entice people um, to do something that, that, that historically um, hasn't worked in their lifetime. Um, and I think that's how you get a bigger turnout is by connecting it to, to everyday people's lives and just having real conversations with people um, about the past and about where we're at right now. And I'll just say briefly, you, we can't lose hope. Um, you know, I, I think a part of this despair, disillusionment is so that we give up, that we give up the fight. Um, no doubt there are very real institutional barriers that continue to keep us um, from doing this and continue to keep us from fighting, and those must be addressed. But we also can't lose lose hope, and and that's why we have to organize in our communities to talk about, as Ray just mentioned, about how these connect to our everyday lives and why this matters. And we also, along the way, we have to make it easier to vote. It, it should not be so complicated, right? We should have automatic voter registration. We should have a, 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 our election day as a national holiday. These are all the steps that we need to be need to be taking and we have yet to take these steps. And there are those in power right now who at the federal level who could make these steps, but there are procedural rules and small procedural tools like the filibuster that are keeping us from making these steps. So one of the things that you can certainly do is call your legislators, but you can also call your members of Congress to fight for these issues. And we see things like redistricting. This is concerning. Uh, thankfully, we have those uh, who are litigating and pushing against and fighting for. And you have the everyday people, many of you on this call, who have been filling in these uh, these committee rooms when they happen and trying to continue to raise your voice of why this matters. But we got to fight every single day. I mean, it is not something that just happens every two years or every four years, right? You have elections every single year, the local level, and, the le and, and then, of course, at the federal level. But we have to be engaged and involved. And then, as Ray mentioned, especially when we talk about ballot initiatives, we saw the police, police accountability in Cleveland, seeing that uh, pass issue 24, all these steps that people can make. 
the fights for initiatives of their map, seeing those paths. There are steps that we can make, but we have to do it together. Um, but at the same time, those in power have to act. If you have the ability, you have to act because otherwise, at a certain point, there's only so much we can do uh, in this fight. You can't out-organize voter suppression. You cannot do that. And so we have to do as much as we're going to do as possible, but we need to get some help uh, from those at the very top and those in power. All right. Thank you for all of those great remarks. It's given us a lot to chew on. I think from whether it's really high level um, thoughts that we're connecting to really basic nitty gritty tactics that each of us can do in our daily lives. I think it's been really helpful. Mia, do you want to um, switch back? I think we have a few slides that as we wrap up about how some specific ways that people can take action. All right, so um, there are a number of things that are happening right here, right now in Ohio, where we could use some folks on this call to sort of lean in to help have their voices heard. Um, there is a movement to stop the death penalty, which we know is deeply flawed, it's super racist, lots of errors um, impacting the system. So please feel free to click on the link to contact your lawmakers to support ending the death penalty. We also have a bill that's moving uh, the Ohio protest bill, which is super dangerous. It's essentially trying to um, you know, limit us from using our First Amendment rights to be out in the streets, objecting, using our voices when we know that there are injustices. Um, so please contact your House of Representatives to have them reject uh, House Bill 109. Um, and then we also have a bail reform campaign. The ACLU is um, pushing forward and they're looking for some, you know, some short videos and either your voices to why, um, you know, having a bail reform is super important and essential to having racial justice. So um, we will send out these slides and click on the links so you don't need to like, we'll send all this to you so that you can have it and take action uh, tomorrow. All right, a few other actions. Um, we mentioned the sentencing database that's, um, that's happening and um, being piloted around the state. We wanna make sure that the database um, that Maureen O'Connor has been championing, we wanna make sure that that really takes hold. And that's gonna mean that we have continued funding for the platform. So lend your support, let legislators know that you are supportive of having some real good data that helps us track whether or not, um, does how to the extent that there are racial disparities. Um, so that is a very important uh, project that we're gonna wanna push. Um, as we mentioned, we gotta make sure that you're paying attention to judicial elections, uh, prosecutorial elections, local elections. Um, in order to find out about judicial uh, elections, you can go to judicialvotescount.com. There you can see all the candidates running, judicial candidates running in your communities. Because um, lots of folks are always wondering, like, where do I get more information about specific judicial candidates? So that's your spot there. Um, looks like Mia's got some has some connections for how we can donate books to area prisons, which sounds like a really great project. And um, and then as Ray mentioned, you know, we're going to want to be talking to our neighbors. It's great that we were all here on this on this call, getting fired up and educating ourselves. But we've got to spread the word. We've got to start telling our neighbors and our friends about why these issues are, are critical. So um, if you wanna get some more information about how you can be a really good campus partner, you can contact Ray and his contact information will be shared with you tomorrow. All right, well, stay in touch with us. We're gonna be sending up all of the slides and the, the resources and all of that out. Uh, tomorrow after this webinar, we certainly appreciate you being here with us. We appreciate all of our wonderful panelists and all of the information they shared. This has been super enlightening and um, enjoyable, and I'm so grateful for you. And we will be in touch in 2022 for ways how we can carry this forward. Yes, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. A uh, quick note, can I have my colleagues and panelists stay behind after we end? Thank you all and good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you.